full 27 minutes after we were supposed to start recording this episode of the show before the show podcast. My computer is functioning enough for us to do so, and it's with that great excitement that we welcome you into the latest edition of the official podcast of Minor League Baseball, along with Benjamin Hill and Sam Dykstra. My name is Tyler Mon. Guys, uh, keep your fingers crossed. This thing stays on. Hi, how are you? Good, Tyler. You you are coming to us apparently from a cave. Yeah, uh, you have decided to record in complete darkness today, and Correct. I don't know why you have your your uh, video on. Right, you are. It's just like we know you're here. We can hear you. But I do. We cannot uh, really see you. you I look- do very much look like uh, like an old 1970s game show contestant, where like you have to guess who I am or something. I have like a there's like a window behind me, and that's where all the lighting is, and you can't really see my face. Uh, that was the whole point today. I, uh, you know, I wanted to remain mysterious as much as possible. Sure. That's, that's what you go for every week is just mysterious. Okay. Mysterious mon is what I try to stay it. out of the way. Obviously I'm not really, uh, I don't really suck the air out of all these rooms, uh, with all of my constant talking, uh, Ben, what's going on, man. Yeah. I'm coming to you guys live and direct from a uh, hotel room in Biloxi, Mississippi, where I will finish up my, uh, road trip, seeing the shuckers tonight. Um, as I've been talking with Sam off air, the weather here is uh, not great. And the weather on this trip hasn't been great, but I've gotten all the games in so far. Um, yesterday, uh, getting here from Pensacola was the worst worst drive I think I've ever done on any of these road trips. And those go back to 2010. Just heavy, heavy rains, thunderstorm, low visibility, flash flood alerts, tornado warnings, and... Uh, I just didn't know what to do. I just kept driving because I, I I kept thinking like, is this the worst mistake I've ever made in my life? But there were other cars on the road, and hey, I made it. But man, it's been some pretty ugly weather here uh, on the Gulf Coast in uh, the Florida Panhandle. Well, we are very happy that you are uh, safe and sound in Biloxi, and we are going to kick off this week's episode of the show before the show podcast, talking about that very road trip. And uh, if you are tuned to the podcast and have a question for Ben about the road trips or, you know, you want to get in touch about something else regarding your love of minor league baseball. Uh, give us a shout podcast at MILB.com. You can find us all on social media as well uh, at Ben's biz at Sam Dykstra, MILB and at Tyler Mon. And uh, we're going to kick this off today with some very cool news from the major league side of things which ties into uh, Ben's current road trip. And that awesome news, if you did not hear it uh, earlier this week, we're actually recording kind of early this week on Tuesday. Uh, but by the time you hear this, this news will be uh, out there into the public and uh, generating a lot of excitement as it is already. Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama, which is the oldest professional ballpark in the United States, former home to the Negro Leagues, Birmingham Black Barons, will play host to a major league regular season game on June 20th. 2024. So a year from the day that we are recording this, uh, this could not be a cooler story. This is something that we've kind of talked about before uh, on the podcast about, you know, as MLB continues to explore these cool new avenues of playing internationally, playing at the Field of Dreams, playing the Little League Classic, uh, you know, would Rickwood Field be a venue for something like this? And it is going to be in 2024. Not only is that awesome, uh, but Ben was actually just there. Ben uh, swinging through Birmingham and getting a chance uh, after checking out a Barons game to check out the former home of the Birmingham Black Barons, Rickwood Field, which of course for a long time uh, played host to a minor league regular season series. Uh, with the Birmingham Barons taking part in that. But Ben, tell us about the uh, the sojourn through Birmingham so far. Yeah, I mean, the uh, I was in Birmingham on the Thursday seeing a game at the Barons' new home of Regents Field. And on Friday, this past Friday, uh, I stopped by Rickwood Field. And it opened in 1910 and has the designation of America's oldest ballpark. Uh, you know, it hosted the Birmingham Barons, uh, the minor league team, mostly in the Southern Association and Southern League, Uh, From 1910 all the way through 1986, of course, as Tyler mentioned, it hosts the Birmingham Black Barons as well. And from 1996 through 2019, it was the home of the Rickwood Classic, where the Barons would return there once a year for a regular season game. I got to attend that in 2010, which was celebrating the centennial of Rickwood Field at the time. And uh, one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of, that was one of my very early road trips. Uh, Harmon Killebrew was the guest of honor at that game because he had played at Rickwood Field. Um, as a member of the Chattanooga Lookouts. And that's just indicative of the names that have passed through Rickwood Field from 1910, you know, all the way through 1986. 
Um, you know, probably most notably Willie Mays in 1948. He was 17. He grew up outside of Birmingham and he made his, um, not his professional debut, because I think he had a few games with the Chattanooga Choo Choo's, but he had some of his first games ever as a professional with the Birmingham Black Barons at Rickwood Field and in the Negro Southern League. And now that Major League Baseball is recognizing Negro League statistics, uh, that team uh, will be part of his Major League record that he played for in 1948, you know, three years prior to making his debut with the New York Giants. So, so much history there. And the, the timing worked out that, you know, I was there just before uh, they made this announcement. I mean, how amazing is it that a ballpark that opened in 1910 will host its first major league game in 2024? And of course, it also means the return of the Barons, because two days prior to the Giants and the Cardinals playing uh, in 2024, on June 18th, the Birmingham Barons will host the Montgomery Biscuits. So there will be a minor league component as well. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the Rickwood Classic happening again in, in this new format. And um, really hope I can make it back out to Birmingham next year to attend it. Um, going to Rickwood Field last Friday, I mean, the ballpark is in remarkably good shape for a ballpark that opened in 1910. And uh, there's an organization called uh, Friends of Rickwood that deserves the lion's share of the credit for that. Um, they have over the years, you know, very a volunteer community driven effort, you know, put in so much work to keep the ballpark in decent shape. But over the next year, obviously, to meet the standards of playing um, Major League Baseball, there's going to be a lot more improvements. So what's going to happen and why this is so cool is not just the game itself, but the investment into Rickwood Field will, that will ensure its viability for years to come. Um, it's going to be in better shape in 2024 than arguably that it's ever been, You know, going all the way back to 1910 in terms of uh, what will be implemented there on the playing field, and the infrastructure of the stadium. So it's just such a cool thing for a ballpark with that much history to get this new life, uh, you know, 113, 114 years after it opened. Yeah, Ben, and I want to go back to what you were talking about with that Rickwood Classic that you went to in 2010, because um, for a lot of people, I think this is the first time they're hearing about Rickwood, uh, at least the general baseball populace. I mean, they, maybe they've heard about, you know, Willie Mays' history or stuff like that. And, they know about the Field of Dreams game or the Little League game that Tyler was talking about earlier. They know that there are special events in baseball. Here's one that I think the primary reason for this is is education, right? Is to get people to know what Negro League teams we're playing in, what some of these stadiums are that are still in existence. But we're also coming from this from the point of view that there have been minor league games in this park before. So what do you remember from that 2010 game? You mentioned Har Harmon Killebrew being there. Uh, but in terms of how they incorporated some of the old timey aspects of it, some of the throwback nature, uh, what was that like? Yeah, you know, they had live brass bands. And um, in addition to Harmon Killebrew, um, you know, the players themselves, both the home Birmingham Barons and uh, you know, visiting Tennessee Smokies wore uniforms from you know the 1910 era. Not, not uniforms that were made in 1910, you know, made out of wool and burlap or whatever it would have been. But, you know, period specific uniforms. Um, you know, game day employees dressed in, in old timey, you know, like straw hats and like red and white striped shirts, um, you know, live brass bands playing outside the ballpark. Um, so it was a really amazing event. And I remember being a little struck because it wasn't even sold out in my mind at that time. And really still today, I was like, how does this event not just sell out every year and, and be a national event? And it was kind of, I think, for people who were, were paying attention one of those little, one of many, you know, best kept secrets you find in the minor leagues that, you know, for almost 25 years, you could go see a game at Rickwood Field, a regular season double A minor league game. And being there in 2010, which was marking the centennial, you know, was extra special. And as I said, it was one of my very first road trips. Um, I think it was the second one I ever did. And both were to Alabama. Uh, my first ever official road trip in 2010 was going to Mobile uh, Hank Aaron Stadium, where they relocated Hank Aaron's childhood home to the grounds of the stadium. And Hank Aaron was there, and Willie Mays was there, and Reggie Jackson was there, and um, Ozzie Smith was there, and Bob Feller was there. And that was an amazing event. And then the next trip I did was, um, you know, meeting Harmon Killebrew at the Rickwood Classic. So I had no idea what I was doing, but to have met Hall of Famers of that caliber and seen ball, um, you know, such historic, um, 
settings and locations and backgrounds was just really amazing that year and something I always remembered. I, I was able to visit Rickwood again in 2013 when I went to go see the opening of the new home of the Birmingham Barons, which they still in play, play in today, Regents Field. And uh, now to be back a decade later with this news coming, it is just awesome. And what are some of the like unique aspects of playing in that place? I mean, you were tweeting a thread earlier today about, you know, walking through the park right now. Um, it seems like they still have that old time scoreboard, uh, hand operated scoreboard with teams that are still that were like representative of the 1940s, maybe of what the Southern League was at the time. I'm sure that's going to change by the time San Francisco and St. Louis rolls through. But like, what are some unique aspects of that place? Yeah, I mean, it was built in 1910 before the advent of night baseball. So the light towers, I don't know at what point those were added, but they're those huge metal, not not portable light towers, but, you know, just towering over the fields, um, which give it a real old fashioned feel. The scoreboard, as you mentioned, um, that still is set to, you know, MLB matchups of long ago. Um, you know, you can see the Brooklyn Dodgers on it. Um Southern League matchups, which I was corrected on Twitter today, it was actually the Southern Association for most most of the time in which the uh, Barons played. And in a shameful chapter of um, baseball history, the Southern Association basically went defunct after uh, refusing to integrate. So, you know, that history is all tied up as well. Um, that You know, the, the segregation going that, that the minor league team uh, and the, the league that the Barons are part of chose to essentially disband. Uh, in the early 60s rather than integrate and uh, the Birmingham Bar uh, Black Barons of course played there uh, through the 60s as well and that's something that people often overlook with um, the Negro Leagues that even though Jackie Robinson made his debut in 1947 you know they lasted for another 15 years or so because it's not like he opened the door but it's not like it just everyone all of a sudden had an opportunity immediately it took a long time for baseball to fully integrate but you have the light towers you have the um the classic scoreboard, the dugouts are like sunken into the playing field. So you can basically stand in the dugout and um, it, 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 you only have about maybe a foot or two feet with which to see over the lip of the dugout when you're it's standing. It's actually dug out. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. And that is, I believe the, uh, is it the etymology? I, I forget which one means the roots of words and which one means insects, but uh, I think it's the etymology. Etymology. Yeah. I think yeah, entomology is, is insects. Uh, <laughs> yeah, how weird. Entomology is insects. Etymology is uh, the is word roots. But I think that's where the term dugout comes from. I mean, it was literally dug out of the playing field as a place for players to stand. Um, and there's period advertisements on the walls as well, which is really cool. And right now, I imagine this will change once MLB really gets its operation set up, making all these improvements. It probably will be closed to the public for some time. But, you know, on Friday and I'm probably today, you can just show up at Rickwood and walk in. It's open to the public every day and has been for a very long time, uh, which is such a cool thing if you're in Birmingham to be able to go visit uh, for free. And, uh, you know, there's a little gift shop. You can support the friends of Rickwood that way. You can make a donation, um, but it's open to the public every day. And it's been a true labor of love to keep that ballpark, um, you know, up to the standards that it's in today, as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, you think about what the standards are for playing a major league baseball game with, you know, the padding on the walls, with the um, the specifics of the playing field, with the specifics of the light. Um, it will be a chat. It's an awesome thing. All these improvements are going to be made, but uh, there probably will be some concessions or hard decisions uh, where it's, you know, between preserving those elements of the past and making it also playable for the modern day game in 2024 and beyond. Uh, so that will be interesting. But given the historic nature of the ballpark, I'm sure every effort will be made uh, to make it so um, it continues. You know, it still has that throwback charm. I mean, that goes without saying. Well, Ben, it's not just the history of Birmingham baseball, but that area um, really plays host to so much of baseball's roots. And you're talking about the, you know, the the Southern Association and the the Negro Southern Leagues and all of that. Um, and I know you got a chance to have conversations with a lot of people down there about the history in that area, but especially uh, in Birmingham, we're going to hear one of those conversations today. Yeah, there's a museum. The Birmingham Barons now play at Regents Field in downtown Birmingham. There's a museum not attached to the ballpark, but located just beyond left field called the Negro Southern League Museum. And I stopped there on Thursday before going to see a game at Regents Field and uh, spent some time with the director of the museum, Frank Adams Jr., 
who showed me around. And it's a small museum, but it's really well curated and has so much memorabilia and artifacts related to um, the Negro Southern League, of which the Black Barons were a part, you know, very uh, specific emphasis on the Black Barons, uh, the Industrial League uh, teams throughout Birmingham, because Birmingham was an industrial city. That's how it grew. So there's a lot of um, memorabilia, artifacts, and information related to all the uh, Industrial Leagues. And um, it's such a cool thing to go to Birmingham. Not only can you go to Rickwood Field, you can go to this museum and uh, learn about the history that way. So there's just so many little side trips in, in Birmingham that make it worth visiting. And um, so go to that museum, the Negro Southern League Museum, uh, located right near Regents Field. And I sat down with uh, the, as I said, the director of the museum, uh, Frank Adams Jr., and talked to him about how the museum came about, plans for the future, what fans can see there now. And i um, happy to share that with everybody right now. Frank Adams, and what is your title with the museum? I'm the director of the Negro Southern League Museum. Director of the Negro Southern League Museum. And you know, for those who don't know, what is the Negro Southern League Museum? The Negro Southern League Museum is a um, baseball-themed museum here in Birmingham, Alabama dedicated to recognizing, celebrating um, the accomplishments of Negro League players and Industrial League players through the experience of Birmingham. And what was your path to becoming involved with the museum and being in the position you're in today? So as a lifelong baseball fan, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with um, the, the city of Birmingham's leadership. And uh, when this role came open, uh, I expressed some interest in, in the role as a baseball fan. And once I got here, I realized that I have one of the best jobs in America because <laughs> of, of the fact that I can come to work every day and celebrate baseball. And not only celebrate baseball, but really talk about the development of baseball in America uh, through the, the prism of Birmingham and how um, Birmingham impacted the national pastime. And, um with the location, you're in the, the shadow of Regents Field, Birmingham's uh, the home of the Birmingham Barons. Um, you know, what have been those partnerships like with, um, you know, with the Barons themselves and you know other organizations throughout the city? Well, I always tell people if they're looking for our museum, we're in left field yeah. uh, at Regents Park, and that is extraordinary to be in the shadow of such a world class facility, and uh, to have the partnership that we've had since 2015 on our opening with the Birmingham Barons. Uh, it's, it's very, very um, helpful to be this close to the Barons home stadium because we get to talk about um, the development of Negro League Baseball, but we also do it through the context of the Barons because the Birmingham Black Barons are synonymous with the Barons and also with the development of Negro League Baseball. So it's a wonderful partnership that we know will continue into the future. We look forward to celebrating their milestones and um, the history that the Birmingham Barons have with our museum and as well as with Rickwood Field. And there are, you know, obviously Negro League teams, Industrial League teams all over the country and so many stories to be told. Um, but what about Birmingham specifically it makes it such a, a rich town for this kind of history and the players who came through and, and all the stories that can be told? Well, the Birmingham Black Barons were, uh, was a legendary organization in the pantheon of Negro League Baseball, winning championships in 43, 44, 1948, uh, producing some of the greatest players in Negro League history, as well as um, being sort of the, uh, the way you, you really develop an organization inside out, and having a good farm system, and having uh, players like Willie Mays, and, and uh, others come through Birmingham and play for the Barons, Frank Thomas and others uh, from modern era. Um, really speaks to the attractiveness that baseball has to this area. Uh, Birmingham has always been very, very supportive of baseball as a community. And um, the fact that we have the largest number, or have the largest number, of retired Negro League players in any other community speaks to that. That once those players played here, they tended to stay here. And that was a very, very good thing for Birmingham because the talent base was here. Baseball being the top sport for a long time had the best players in the Negro Leagues here and um, that com 
combined with the fact that parents have been all successful over the years is something that's very, very important in terms of, of saying to the baseball world that Birmingham is a very, very important area for baseball and the fact that we have the oldest ballpark that's still in continuous operation here at Brookfield uh, lends itself to that. And uh, you mentioned a, a few big names just now, you know, Willie Mays, chief mm-hmm. among them. Uh, but what are some of the lesser known stories or teams that um, you're now in a position to tell their stories that, that you think are most interesting or most, mm-hmm. most, need in, most in need of publicity? I think Piper Davis was a very unique player uh, amongst the pantheon of great players who played in Birmingham. Piper Davis was a gentleman who uh, played in the industrial leagues initially and ended up playing for uh, the Barons and becoming um, you know, the manager of the Black Barons. And he was someone who was very influential on Willie Mays, a young Willie Mays who played on that 1948 championship team. Uh, he was about 16 years old. And Piper Davis was someone who was also a great teacher of the game. Uh, he taught a lot of ball players who came through Birmingham how to play the game, uh, the speed of the game, the power, uh, all of the finesse that you come to associate with Negro League teams. Piper Davis was in the middle of that. And he was an inspiration. Uh, most of the players in our museum were great players, obviously, but they were also inspirations. They were people who um, young players inspired to be one day. They were very, very um, open and honest about the experiences they had as players and as, as leaders in their community. And so I think Piper Davis is someone who uh, really deserves more uh, thorough research, uh, both as a player and as a, a leader in his community. Yeah, and you have um, you know, uniforms, contracts, um, all sorts of memorabilia related to Piper Davis and so many others. Uh, you know, what was the process of acquiring, uh, borrowing, just obtaining, and however you need to do it, um, such a great collection um, of material to, to make this museum really be able to display in vivid detail what these teams were like and what these players were like? Well, the museum is a partnership between the city of Birmingham and the Center for Negro League Baseball Research. Dr. Layden Ravel is the executive director of the, of the center, and uh, his partnership with the city of Birmingham was critical because he has such a huge collection. He had a friend who played Negro League Baseball, and after that friend passed away, he decided he wanted to start collecting memorabilia because there wasn't a lot that was organized. Um, he found out that a lot of the players kept most of their memorabilia. Uh, some of it was in attics, some of it was in basements, some had been given to family members when they passed on. But he took it upon himself to go around the country and collect the exhibits that we have here uh, in the museum and a lot more that we don't. Um, so um, him being able to go to all these different communities uh, in the Deep South and around the country and collecting these materials from families and former players was very, very important. Uh, there's a level of authenticity that we have here at the, at the Southern Negro the Negro Southern League Museum that is unique because uh, the majority of the items that we have are authentic and that they are uh, game used and game worn. And so that um, really takes you back in time. It lets you see what the players were using, the equipment they were using. It lets you see the type of uniforms they were wearing. So it's, it's more than nostalgic. It really takes you back to that time. And that's a very, very authentic experience. And obviously, baseball fans are going to be interested in visiting a museum like that. Uh, but besides that, maybe that broad and most obvious demographic, you know, who are you trying to attract and bring to this museum in order to tell these stories? So we are very, very focused on uh, the baseball fan in general, but specifically younger fans as well. Um, people who may not know the depth and breadth of Negro League Baseball and Industrial League Baseball and how important those two elements were to the development of the game, but also very focused on, on children, uh, making sure that, um, specifically uh, local children, that they have a very strong tie to the national pastime and that um, you know there are some, some legendary figures that played baseball here in Birmingham and went on and did some great things. And so uh, the baseball fan in general would love this place. I think children absolutely adore it. And um, anyone who um, has just a, a little bit of knowledge about baseball can walk away with so much more knowledge when they walk out. And um, when we were talking earlier, something you mentioned is being able to um, you know, think of new exhibits and um, you know, maybe cycle things out, bring in new things. You're at that stage in the museum now. Um, when you think about the future, what are the things that, that get you most excited on that front? Well, we're really excited about our upcoming Women in the Negro Leagues exhibit. Uh, we have a temporary exhibit now, but once that's installed, 
uh, that will say to, to young women uh, like the future Monet Davises that they have a place in the game, that um, baseball is a wonderful sport that's open to all, and that um, there were some really dynamic women who not only played the game, but they owned teams, and they were entrepreneurs, and they were um, leaders in their community. So that's a very important message to share with, with young women. Um, also, making sure that uh, we try to celebrate uh, the well-known uh, baseball players, but also those who are, are less well-known, uh, giving them an opportunity to, to share their story through the museum. Um, because we really are a repository of that history uh, that may not be told anywhere else. And so uh, being able to rotate exhibits, working with the Center for Negro League Baseball Research, and uh, making sure that we're really highlighting different players, not just from Birmingham, but across the country, is very, very important in terms of relevancy and making sure that our exhibits are as fresh as they can be. You mentioned Piper Davis, but I guess to close out, how about one more? Who's a, uh, as a Birmingham you know, native yourself and someone so knowledgeable about the history, um, when you think of Birmingham baseball, who's another name that really jumps out to you? The name that jumps out most quickly to me is Sam Harrison. Sam Harrison, who played uh, in the Negro Leagues, was from West Birmingham, not far from where I grew up, uh, who was not allowed to play in the major leagues, but ended up having a huge impact uh, on the, the Barons, Birmingham Barons, um, over the years as the first African-American coach to join the staff. But uh, the great story is the legacy that he left uh, with his sons and his grandsons all going and playing in the major leagues. And it's a, it's a great family. It's a family that, um, um, it's, it's a baseball family. It's a family that, that really uh, demonstrates perseverance and overcoming some challenges and, and obstacles to be great at what you love. And I think that's a great American story. It's not just a baseball story. Yeah, and that's what this museum is, American stories. Yes. And uh, so if you're in Birmingham, you're near left field of Regents, uh, Regents Field, yeah. then come and see it. Um, I guess that's about all I had for you, unless uh, there's anything you want to add, anything I missed? No, uh, I just look forward to uh, all your listeners coming and visiting and, and walking away more informed about the, the great game we love. Sure. I'm sure. Hopefully you get uh, some more visitors as a, as a result of this. And just in general, um, great stories to be told. Thanks so much for talking to me. Hey, thank you. Well, that was Frank Adams, Jr., the director of the Negro Southern Leagues Museum. Uh, the Negro Southern League Museum. No plural on leagues there. Um, really enjoyed getting to know him uh, and him taking the time to walk me through the museum and have that conversation. And uh, just hours after I visited the museum, I was at Regents Field proper to see a game. Um, the Birmingham Barons play the Tennessee Smokies. And talk about Rickwood Field and all its historic charm. Regents Field opened in 2013 and is, you know, even 10 years later, still just one of the premier ballparks of the Southern League and all of minor league baseball, a gleaming, imposing downtown facility, um, really, really cool exterior signage with Birmingham all, all across the side in huge letters. Uh, you know, in, in steel, uh, you know, harkening back to those industrial roots. So it was great to be, be back there for the first time in 10 years and see a game at Regents Field. And uh, one of the things is I was there 10 years ago and I found an article I wrote in which I was just talking about the surrounding landscape of downtown Birmingham at the time. And, you know, weed strewn vacant lots and a team bus uh, parked next to an abandoned building and all these um, elements that were in place in 2013 and how I couldn't find a parking spot anywhere. And it was fun to dig up that article because 10 years later, there's been so much development around the area and the skyline view at Regents Field uh, is now filled with you know, new buildings, a lot of them residential units uh, that weren't there before. But, you know, it's always a debate, you know, building new ballparks, the effect they have on downtown revitalization, the use of public money. And, you know, I, I think it's something you have to look at in a case-by-case -case basis. But 10 years later, it's it's hard to compare it to 10 years ago and uh, think that the ballpark didn't play a huge role in, in downtown, the Parkside District in Birmingham, as it's now called uh, now, versus what it was 10 years ago. So it was really cool to be back. And, uh, and also just to contrast the old and the new, Rickwood Field versus Regents Field and the continuity of this team, uh, the Barons, that date all the way back to the 19th century. The first team called the Barons was actually called the Coal Barons in 1885. So here in the year 2023, the, the Birmingham Barons are still going strong. So, so much history in the area and uh, so much history being made today at the ballpark. It's just a fun place to visit. 
and really a sneaky good baseball town is Birmingham. And Ben, before we were talking about how the minor league game at Rickwood Field next year will be between uh, the Birmingham Barons and the Montgomery Biscuits. Montgomery was another stop on your trip to the South. Uh, and you have another short clip here to present uh, with a former Montgomery broadcaster, soon to be former Montgomery broadcaster for the best of reasons. Take us through that. Yeah, he's former now. Uh, we can get into the rest of my Biscuits experience next week, but I was at Riverwalk Stadium where Chris Adams Wall is the Bar- is the Montgomery Biscuits play-by-play guy. And he had been with the Biscuits since 2015, you know, put in a lot of time with the Biscuits. And he had just gotten the call up, as it were, to the Tampa Bay Rays. He'll now be doing the pre and post game shows on the Tampa Bay's radio network. And he was finishing up his stint with the with the Biscuits when I was there. I talked to him on Friday. His last game with the Biscuits was on Sunday. And he's starting with the Rays uh well, the day this podcast will come out, Thursday, June 22nd. So it was interesting to um, talk to him. I did an interview with him. There's an article on MILB.com you can read about his time with the Biscuits and his thoughts on finally getting that major league call up. But there's uh, one little clip from that interview that I'd like to share where he talks about how he got the Biscuits job in the first place. It was through Joe Davis, who also was a former Biscuits announcer. And it's just funny how life works out. So here's a little clip from Chris Adams Wall. And congratulations to him. He's moved on from Montgomery Biscuits to the Tampa Bay Rays. And then it was in Montgomery that you know, Joe Davis was was more tearing. When you first got the job, was that make it a little more appealing, knowing that it could be a springboard in that manner? It, it makes it a little bit more challenging because <laughs> Joe, as we know, is pretty good at what he does. Called the World Series last year, took over for Vince Scully. I ended up at the Biscuits because of Joe Davis, though. So I was working as a production assistant at Fox Sports in Los Angeles, and I was working on a remote production crew working college football games. So every week, I was rolling out of my bed in K-Town and near downtown Los Angeles, getting in an Uber, taking my American Airlines flight to Seattle, to Morgantown, West Virginia, to Austin, Texas, working that game, and then coming home. My second year doing that job, the lead play-by-play announcer on our crew was Joe Davis. And I'm sitting there wondering, how am I the same age as this guy? I'm a little older than Joe, too, by a few months. I'm, yeah, I'm the lowest guy on the totem pole in this production crew. The broadcaster's younger than me. How is this guy so good? How is he is where he is? And then I started to talk to Joe. You know, we, we became good friends. And one day in particular, I remember we had a, a USC football game, and I was driving him from the 20th Century lot in Century City to downtown L.A., and he asked me, so is this what you want to do? You want to do production? And I said, well, actually, I want to do what you do. And he said, well, then you can't wait around and continue to think about it. you got to act on it. I said, okay, do you know anybody? He said, I do. And he gave me Aaron Vargas' number, and Aaron Vargas was Joe's number two, his last season with the Biscuits. Aaron was the lead broadcaster with the Biscuits at the time in 2015, and he was looking for some help. And so then I became one of the first people, I think, in human history to move from Los Angeles, California to Montgomery, Alabama. It has been the best experience of my life though. I can't, it couldn't have worked out better. I worked for free as a number two, learned how to broadcast baseball, even though I had never broadcast a baseball game in my life. Uh, I did some in college, right? Football, basketball, hockey, never baseball. But Joe gave me that chance and so did Aaron. And so I feel extraordinarily grateful that that happened. Aaron was a fantastic broadcaster. If Aaron was still around, first of all, he wouldn't be in double-A. He'd be in the majors. But if he were still with the Biscuits, he probably would have been a shoe in for the job that I got. So the fact that he left really set things up nicely for me. Had to wait a little while, but sometimes it's worth the wait. Well, uh, great stuff from Ben Hill. And as you can tell, uh, great stuff to come as well as uh, Ben's road trip continues. And uh, hopefully the driving conditions will improve for Ben because that sounded uh, harrowing. Uh, But a huge thanks to Ben as always. And with that, uh, we're going to talk some more on-field stuff as another midseason market corrections uh, is coming to MILB uh, prospects for MLB Pipeline. And uh, one of our prospect gurus is one Samuel C. Dykstra. And Sam, we have had conversations throughout the year about uh, top prospects who has the most helium, who is climbing fastest, who is 
uh, headed to their big league debut, maybe a little bit uh, sooner than we thought. Um, and there are also guys who we've just kind of expected to do what they have done so far this season, but there is a really good conversation to be had about some names to be at the very top of that list. Uh, who right now is in sort of that three headed monster in the argument for a top prospect in baseball? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned it, Tyler, just to set the scene a little bit more, we do market corrections every once in a while, just because, you know, the more data we get, the more games that are played, we want the list to reflect what we know when we know it. Um, but market corrections are not a complete one top 100 revamp. We're not voting on the top 100 all over again. We're just moving guys who need to move. Uh, and in June, that's going to be a lot of guys. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be a lot of movement. Uh, we try to move guys at least 10 spots up or down if they're moving three or four that we don't generally touch them right now. Um, and we revote on the entire top 15, which leads us into our conversation here of who is the number one overall prospect in baseball right now? Because I do think it's a legitimate debate. Um, pre update right now, it's Jackson Churio, and Milwaukee Brewers, who longtime listeners of the show know I am a big Jackson Churio fan dating back to around about this time last year when he was. Uh, moving up to single A, completely skipping over the Arizona Complex League, climbed three levels last year, uh, showed really good power, even better speed, uh, an ability to play a quality center field, and pretty much hit everywhere he went except for double A. Now he's 19, still at double A, not moving as quick anymore. Double A has kind of been the point in which he's been challenged offensively. Uh, and, you know, he's somebody who can certainly make an impact, but the bat isn't quite there for what we thought, which makes it a more open question of who is number one overall. If you've been following minor league baseball the last few months, you probably know the other two candidates. They are Ellie De La Cruz, who is now in the majors with the Cincinnati Reds and instantly providing a jolt to that team. I mean, Tyler, I'm sure you've seen this too. The Reds are calling themselves America's team. Which Reds are a very fun team right they now. They are fun. Like yeah. I have no problem with it because yeah. guess what? Something electric is going to happen. I mean, we talked plenty about like what Ellie brings to the table. It's elite speed. It's elite power. Uh, they're moving them between shortstop and third base right now. Uh, it's just, can he hit the ball enough? That's what it comes down to. He's, he struck out 30% of the time everywhere he's been. That continues to be in the major leagues. Uh, but, you know, putting Ellie De La Cruz in that lineup and Joey Votto even talked about that the other day. He came back, which how awesome was that home? Yeah, huh? that was pretty dang cool. Joey Votto smashing a monster Joey Votto esque homer in uh, in his return to the big leagues, pretty damn cool. Yeah, and then did an interview with Sports Center and said, "Hey, listen, like Ellie De La Cruz is kind of like becoming the heart and soul of this team. He's he's providing a jolt that we need and that that city needs. To be honest with you, uh, at least the baseball loving part of that city needs because it, it seems like they were in the doldrums just back in April." Now, this NL Central being as wide open as it is, they have a seat at the table. Not only that, they're leading the division as we talk here on Tuesday. So, uh, Ellie De La Cruz definitely in that conversation. It's just, can he hit enough? I mean, like, when he puts bat on ball, it's loud. It goes, it's incredibly loud. He already has the best exit velocity on this Reds team, and he hasn't been there that long. We know that. But striking out 30% of the time is not sustainable. I mean, it it is it, like it's something he can sustain, but it's worrisome. It's how you end up being just an above average bat instead of a plus bat. It's how you go from a solid player to an all star. If he can cut that down, and he showed part of that in Triple A, but now it's starting to creep up again, and that's why we have serious questions about him. That's why he's not number one with a bullet, even if you watch Major League Baseball the last few weeks and think, how is this guy not the top one hundred pros or number one overall? The other guy is Orioles shortstop. Jackson Holiday, who was the number one pick just last year, has already climbed to high A uh, at such a young age. He's 19 too, just like Jackson Trurio. He's legitimately hit everywhere he's gone. As we're talking here on Tuesday, he has a 330 average for the season, averages and everything. There was a time where he led the minor leagues in OPS. Um, he's got that 345 slash line that you love to see at high A, and that's been sustained over 44 games. So he's uh, you know, he's certainly hitting there. It's been sustainable. He plays a solid shortstop, much more likely to stick there than I think Ellie De La Cruz. Um, even though Ellie De La Cruz has the better arm, I just think Jackson Holiday is a guy you keep it short as long as you can. Um, even though I've always said with Ellie, I want him to be a shortstop as long as he can. He's bouncing back. I don't think that's going to happen with Holiday, but it's just it's how do you weigh like a guy who's in the major leagues right now and who has top of the line tools. 
but is a little less sharp on the biggest tool that I think matters to a hitting prospect, which is the hit tool versus Jackson Holiday, who is very easily projectable to be a potential 300 hitter someday and is good uh, with power and is good with speed, even if he's not reaching those upper limits like Ellie De La Cruz. Tyler, if you were weighing these things, how would you look at it? It's always helpful when I hit the uh, the unmute button. All right, give me the give me the breakdown of how you want my uh, weighed uh, opinion on this. Well, go. just how do you look at it? Do you look at somebody who is legitimately top of the line? Yeah, in multiple categories. Yeah, Elliot De La Cruz. He calls himself the fastest man in the world. Right. Again, top Which, exit velos on the Reds already. Right. But if he's going to strike out thirty to thirty five percent of the time, right. He might end up being closer to a league average bat. So am I trusting more his uh, his talent and his ability to adjust or the body of work so far? Which am I weighing? Yeah, kind of. I, I just think with Jackson Holiday, when you know he's going to hit. Right, right. How much, how much weight does that carry with you? I think in a conversation like this, the thing that weighs most for me is the level at which we've already seen the production. Jackson Holiday obviously is a tremendous player and has been fantastic throughout his very brief pro career. He's the first overall pick last year as uh you know as everybody has known about him since he got into that Orioles system. He's 19, he's doing it at high A. Um for Ellie De La Cruz to be doing this at every stop so far and now doing it in such an electrifying way at the major league level. Like Ellie De La Cruz is hitting 271 with a 769 OPS. He's got one big league homer. That's all very good. He is striking out a lot and yeah Look at the conversations that we're having about him right now. Like, I think his ability to impact games at the big league level, um, that carries me to placing him higher uh, because we know that all of that has already translated to those upper levels and now at the big league level um, than where Jackson Holiday is. And that's certainly no knock on Jackson Holiday. It's just he's so much earlier in his career, uh, and we have not yet seen him at one of the huge separation levels. Now, obviously, Low A and high A, single A and class A advanced, all the terminology that we've used over the last several years to describe those, that is one separating jump. But when we get to double A with Jackson Holiday is when I'm going to be most interested to watch and see what he does. Um, and now granted, he's got a 952 OPS and 44 games at high A this year. So I don't think he's going to struggle all that much. Um, but with what Ellie De La Cruz has already accomplished this year, he would get my vote for that, for knowing this is a skill set that is playable at the major league level. Even if there are still adjustments that he needs to make, um, that's that's how I'm evaluating it. Yeah, and I think that's totally fair. I mean, the, the other end of the spectrum is like you were giving me a good poker face, by the way. I just want to point out Sam was looking into the looking into the screen. I was thinking, does he think I'm an idiot right now? But that was no, good. I don't. I think that this was is good. a legitimate you tip your hand. Yeah, I'm not I appreciate it. I'm not trying to tip my hand. I, I know how this is gonna end up, and I'm trying not to tip my hand in any way. Um because that's the thing, is that the the people who come up with the top 100, me, Jim Callis, Jonathan Mayo, we all have our own votes, we all have our own feelings about this, and we put them all together and we mix them in and we get some industry feedback. And, we, you know, that's what happens with the top 100. So I can have my feelings about this any which way, and I'm not going to give them to you because it might tip our hand. Uh, but at the point of the matter is it's a somewhat of a consensus. Um, so even if I say how I feel, it's not necessarily how things are going to end up. That being said, I think the other thing that you have to kind of weigh in this is like age relative to where they've been. I totally agree with you. I mean, there's a reason why when we do our top 100 lists, you can kind of tell it's usually leaning towards guys with double A, triple A experience, or in the case like last year, when we had Gunnar Henderson or the beginning of this year, I should say, Gunnar Henderson and Corbin Carroll are number one and two because they made the major leagues. We, we'd seen what they had done in the majors. That that carries a lot of weight. I totally agree with you on that. But to Jackson Holiday and Jackson Churio's case, these guys are only teenagers still. Like they haven't had that those chances yet, and they performed yeah. at such a young age. They're yeah. performing against guys who are four or five years their senior, uh, and they're doing this well. I mean, that's easy to project to what happens when they meet the league average for age and they have all that wealth of experience. I mean, by the time that happens, they're probably going to be three, four year major leaguers, which is insane to think about. Um, it, and that, I try to keep that thought process going with other guys too. You look at like Wander Franco. You know, he was the number one overall prospect for a time, came up to the major leagues. I wouldn't call him an 80 hitter anymore, 
but where he is now is really good. It's like a really good player and he's still significantly young. Yeah. Like there was a stretch there where he was one of the 10 youngest or he was younger than like a lot of young top prospects. And that's still the case now. Yeah. After he'd already graduated. After he graduated. Still for like only two 22. Years. You yeah. know, like right. he's still at a level uh, developmentally or age wise where if a guy was in double A, you would think like, oh, yeah, it's an acceptable uh, time frame for him to spend uh, at the double A level. And he's been in the big league since 2021. Right. So I think Jackson Holiday and Jackson Shurio have that on their side. Right. They have time. That being said, it becomes a lot easier to bet on a guy when he has made the major leagues, and we've seen how those tools play. It's a fascinating debate. Um, we are going to release our market correct or market corrections in the top 100 early next week. Keep them peeled on that at, on MLB Pipeline. I'll be tweeting them out. Jim Callis will be tweeting them out. Jonathan Mayo, uh, and yeah, you know, I I embrace the debate as as the saying goes. I'm sure people are going to disagree, no matter how we come down on that. Uh, and I love that for baseball. I love that there's not a clear cut number one and that we can have those debates because that's what part of what makes prospect ranking so fun. So keep your eyes peeled at MLB pipeline for the updated top 100, which is coming. And uh, we were discussing a little while ago, it might be the last top 100 market corrections uh, before the big re-rank coming up after the draft and all that, right? Yes. Yeah. We normally do our re-rank around mid August, which will be after the draft after uh the trade deadline which is such a weird time because like you know there will be guys traded there yeah so much movement around that time i've talked to farm directors who have all said this is the most hectic time in the year why are you calling me now i'm like it's the way it works i'm sorry uh but it yeah this will probably be the last one before then which is crazy to think about but yeah so much going on between now and then anyways so, uh, like we, uh, like we said, keep uh, keep watching. See where your favorite team's favorite prospect lands uh, on the re-rank coming up in MLB Pipeline. Uh, we'll step aside for a timeout. Josh Jackson stops by the show, and we're back to wrap it up on the other side. We interrupt this podcast to bring you another thrilling edition of Ghosts of the Miners. Now, here's your correspondent and host, Joshua Jackson. Welcome back to Ghosts of the Miners, in which all of you out there in radio land must identify the legitimate historical ball club hiding amidst the fraudulent pair. One once played all the live long day. The others never even got up in the morning, or any other time. In the last segment, I asked you which of the following minor league baseball teams did at one point exist. A. The Leadville Leadheads. B. The Silver Spring Silverhawks. C. The Goldsboro Goldbugs. You're rich in knowledge if you picked C. The Goldsboro Goldbugs, who were first unearthed for a lone season in the Eastern Carolina League of 1929 before being dug up for nine non-consecutive seasons in the Coastal Plain League of the 1930s and 40s. At least, that's what's in the books, officially. In reality, the Wayne County, North Carolina town had miners' teams of various names stretching back a good two decades before that, and there's concrete evidence that at least the 1928 one, known in official records now as the Goldsboro Manufacturers, were sometimes also referred to as the Goldbugs. Some sources of our day speculate that the Goldbugs moniker was inspired by the Golden Tortoise Beetle, aka the Goldbug which does occur in North Carolina. But the more popular usage of the term gold bug in the late 19th and early 20th centuries meant people who were mad for the search for gold, or economists or politicians who were adamant about the monetary system of the United States being on the gold standard. The gold in Goldsboro, though, came not from any type of precious metal, but from the name of Matthew Goldsboro, the 19th century railroad engineer whose tracks have been well covered elsewhere. Speaking of elsewhere, the once home of the gold bugs is under no circumstances to be confused with Goldsboro, Pennsylvania, a burg named for Matthew Goldsboro's fellow 19th century engineer and distant cousin, John Goldsboro. 
So, go figure, the gold bugs were anything but a train wreck. Coming in second place in the ECL of 29 before being derailed by the depression-related collapse of the circuit before the spring of 1930. But Goldsboro dusted itself off to reveal a shiny new Gold Bugs team to add some flavor to the Coastal Plain League from 37 to 41, then again for four seasons following the war. Not even the toughest critic could pan the Gold Bugs sequels, as the club made the playoffs four times over those nine seasons, including twice in 1946 and 1948, under manager Bill Herring. Nothing fishy about that. In 1950, though, the Goldsboro Club struck it rich with an affiliation with the St. Louis organization of the National League, becoming the Goldsboro Cardinals. And that's how the gold bugs were for the birds. Now, on to the question for next time. Which of these teams believed more was merrier in the minors of yesteryear? A. The Septet Hill Seven Tops. B. The Kingsport Johnson City Bristol Three Timers. C. The Leakesville Draper Spray Triplets. Want to know the answer? Say it again. Or tune into the next Ghost of the Miners. But for now, you'll have to excuse me. My producer, Ben Hill, is reciting an Allen Ginsberg poem, and I've got to beat it. Getting set to wrap up this week's episode of the Show Before the Show podcast. But before we do, as always, we take you through the promo to watch this week and games to watch this week as well. Ben, on the promotional front, uh, who is most exciting you this weekend? Who would that be? It would be the Tulsa Drillers, who on June 22nd all the way through June 25th, uh, that would be Thursday through Sunday for those uh, keeping score at home, they are having their annual 918 weekend, 918 weekend, which is Tulsa's area code. And for all those four games, they are playing as the Tulsa Sound, paying tribute to uh, to the city's musical legacy. And in the press release, they describe it as the iconic musical style that originated in Tulsa during the second half of the 20th century. The unique Tulsa sound featured a mix of blues, blues rock, country, rock and roll, and swamp pop. The early pioneers of the Tulsa sound, including legends like Leon Russell, J.J. Kale, Roger Tillerson, and Elvin Bishop. And uh, so this Tulsa sound identity uh, features a primary logo that's featured on the hats uh, with a baseball who looks like Leon Russell. Um, you know, who is one of the the main the main people behind that Tulsa sound. Uh, he's a great musician. I saw a great documentary about him a few years ago, I think directed by Les, Les Blank. And uh, so this logo, he's got the top hat, he's got the sunglasses, he's got the goatee and the long kind of Fu Manchu must, mustache, the long hair. So he's a real funky looking dude, very uh, rock and roll, very uh, swamp rock looking and uh, looking forward to seeing what that looks like on the playing field. The Tulsa Drillers playing as the Tulsa Sound with a Leon Russell derived logo, June 22nd through June 25th. That does sound very cool. Um, Sam, what about on the field? What prospects you got an eye on uh, this week slash weekend? Yeah, I wish I had something that was Swamp Rock related because that just seems that would be pretty cool. Very pleasing to say. There used to be a Swamp Rats team didn't there at one time wasn't there a minor league team named the swamp rats or swamp swamp dragons wasn't shreveport and didn't they have the swamp swamp the swamp swamp. dragon (laughs) yeah the shreveport swamp dragons uh, in the texas league i forget they played up in into the early 2000s i forget where they relocated swamp that's the new that's the new term swamp dragons uh sam on field what do you got yeah so uh this one may have become a little less interesting but i actually in my eyes it became even more interesting. And that's Columbus against Indianapolis. And I say, maybe that was a little less interesting because in case you haven't heard 2021, number one overall pick Henry Davis got called up to the pirates uh, this week. They started him in right field, which is notable considering he was drafted as a catcher developed mostly as a catcher. And then the closer he got to Pittsburgh, the more they moved him around the field, they moved him to right. I think part of the reason why that is, is because they still have Andy Rodriguez, who is a, much more athletic catcher, uh, a better defensive prospect. Uh, he's still in Indianapolis, so you can catch him on Saturday. I'm really interested to see how they what they do with him because he's somebody who moved around a lot too. He got some time at second base. He's got some time in the outfield before. Uh, 
He will be going up against Columbus on Saturday. Columbus has a very loaded lineup themselves. George Valera, Brian Rocchio uh, are in that lineup. Uh, they've called up Bo Naylor too. So this is another team that is without its star catcher. Uh, but Quinn Priester is likely to be the starter for an Indianapolis. So you're likely to have Quinn Priester working with Andy Rodriguez. Uh, that NL Central is wide open, right? Like we're seeing that right now. Uh, the Cincinnati Reds leading that division as of when we're talking here on Tuesday, which is so nuts. Pittsburgh's kind of right in the middle of that fight. There's a chance that Andy Rodriguez and Quinn Priester, every start they make, is an audition for Pittsburgh. Uh, they've shown a willingness to call up a guy like Henry Davis if they think they can help. So if these guys really show that they can be consistent at Indianapolis, a call to uh, the Steel City can't be far off. Tyler, what are you looking at? So I've got my eyes, uh, oddly enough, on the top Sam Dykstra prospect in baseball. And that is uh, actually the top overall prospect in baseball, Jackson Churio, who is with AA Biloxi, of course, and not a coincidence that uh, Ben is there right now. And some of the most exciting talent on the field is there right now. We've got all the on and off field talent in Biloxi uh, currently. But Jackson Churio, the numbers this year have been a little bit up and down, and he is still so young uh, for that level. Jackson Churio is still just 19 years old and he only turned 19 back in March. Um, but for a 19 year old in double A, he's still got an OPS uh, over 700. He has been doing uh, a lot of things right. He is also potentially this weekend going to be splitting a field um, with Noel V. Marte, the Reds prospect who has been uh, battling injuries and um, you know, sort of dealing with his own growing pains of sorts this year. Uh, there's the potential that we could see those two guys sharing a field. Uh, it was a mild hamstring strain most recently for Noel V. Marte, uh, who has been out of action for most of the month. Now he did play uh, last night in a rehab game, uh, but it's it still remains to be seen when he will actually return from the Arizona complex league uh, to double a Chattanooga, but Biloxi is worth the, the free price of viewing admission. And uh, so is Chattanooga. They've got Reese Hines as well. Uh, who's been red hot this year. He's the number 16 Reds prospect. And that game and that series on MILB.TV this weekend, free game is coming up Sunday evening at 6.05 p.m. Eastern time. And that'll do it for this week's episode of the show before the show podcast. Next episode, I'm going to be talking to you dudes from across the pond. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this last week, but I'm headed to London tomorrow as part of the uh, the London series festivities, Cubs and Cardinals. I'll be uh, in Trafalgar Square hosting Home Run Derby X. So uh, you know when I get to when I get to launch some virtual bombs on the screen in uh, in Trafalgar Square, you know I, I just want I hope somebody is there with a good enough camera. Yeah, and of the many dingers you're going to hit, just dedicate many one or two dingers. to Benner. Okay, yeah, that's all I'm asking. I can do that. They're like, this one's for you, Dykstra. And then I'll pop it straight up yeah. into the top of the virtual cage. Oh, well, just as, as it's flying, you know. Yeah, as that's it's true. going. I have to the wait for the path. Yeah, let's, and then... let's not call our shots and then dedicate it to me, huh? Let's... All right, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, I'll yeah. save one for you and one for Ben. Well, yeah, and, and travel safe. And we all can't wait until you get back. Back, 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 back. <laughs> Oh, man. For Josh Jackson, Sam Dykstra, and Ben Hill, big thanks to our guests for this week. And uh, my name is Tyler Vaughn. We'll catch you next week.